Hi everyone, welcome to Vigilante Trolling and Contentious Humor as Activism. I am Crystal, a digital anthropologist who studies internet culture. Today I'm going to be talking you through a Facebook-specific troll group that started with just 159 likes in 2011 to becoming a massive interconnected social media network um, today in 2016. But first, some key facts on trolling from scholars who have studied this. I have here a list of work that I consider crucial to anyone who wants to study or is interested in learning about trolling. First up, key work by Gabriella Coleman, who authored the book Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy, Studying the Many Faces of Anonymous. Um, she mostly started looking into this area or this genre of internet culture by looking at hackers. And um, I'll also be talking about a little bit about a upcoming interview that I conducted with her for popend.com. Whitney Phillips also wrote a book literally titled This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things, in which she talks about the relationship between trolling and mainstream culture. So I don't have time to go into all these in depth today, but I think they're really fabulous works to look at. And the other four that you see at the bottom are my favourite pieces of work that look at specific instances of trolling in different parts of the web. For example, RIP trolling, Olympic trolls, trolling in a different ecology outside of the mainstream English Anglo-Saxon sphere, and also Facebook trolling with the use of fluff. Now what is a troll? Obviously many different scholars have different definitions, but I think there are a few key things to note here in the combination of all these three quotes. Trolls are active, mostly enthusiastic, but they also come in many different forms. Sometimes, especially with the mainstream press, we tend to accidentally or misunderstand um, the types of behaviours online. So things like online bullying, aggression, jokes and memes all come together under this big umbrella of trolling, although they are really specific in formats and genres. But Gabriella Coleman um, underscores for us in an upcoming interview with Pop N that there is some sense of a negative consequence, even though most of the time it's this type of action is motivated by a sense of justice. Gabriel Di Sata, who studies trolling in China, also says a lot of times this is fueled by boredom, it's humor, it's also an aggressive type of satire. Why do trolls troll? Um, to disrupt and upset as many people as possible, but mostly for the lulls. Coleman tells us that lulls is the laughter at someone else's expense, and it's inherently a more superior form of humour. From Encyclopedia Dramatica, she tells us that lulls is a linguistic spectacle, um, it's clearly meant to shock and to offend, and it celebrates a form of bliss that revels and celebrates in having a power, a form of joy that's divorced from a moral hinge. Why study trolls? Gabriel Disata tells us that a lot of the research in this area usually highlights the danger of trolling or the damage it can bring. But Gabriela Coleman reminds us that we should also go beyond models of individual pathology. In other words, going beyond, oh, people troll because they are sick, because they are antisocial, or because they are just generally angry people on the internet. She reminds us that trolling is actually a very full-blown cultural-specific phenomenon that is facilitated by the internet but also driven by other social factors. And with that, I proceed on to Singapore, giving you a brief overview before I get into SMRT Feedback Limited. Now, these infographics are taken off the Tourism Board website. Singapore is a really, really tiny space. To get from one end of the island to the other end with no traffic stops in a vehicle, it will take you just less than an hour. It is also a multicultural demographic with four main racial groups and four main languages spoken. However, the dominant language and the dominant language of transaction and business and education is English. Singapore is also very highly interconnected in terms of digital infrastructure, hardware and software. We have among the highest average internet speeds in the world. And internet use and IT savvy is instituted at the educational level from as young as grade school. Elsewhere about internet culture in Singapore, we are really, influen um, really prolific with influencers. These are young everyday stars who become celebrities on the internet and then use their personal lives as a canvas to market products and services. 
a lot of the times, several facets of their personal lives become the commodity on that is being sold to the audience, just by way of having advertorials or advert advertisement editorials being woven in. Now, on the flip side of internet culture in Singapore is political blogging. And many a time, several political bloggers have been issued defamation suits um, or have been made to pay um, summons or sums to the ministry or to the various um, bodies of the government for making insinuating comments. There is a really huge proliferation of alternative media, i.e. not mainstream media, um, ranging from things like the political websites of opposition parties, because Singapore, in its 51 years of history, has been ruled by one dominant party, or with political blogs written by anonymous or pretty prolific internet stars. And these are some examples of such sites. More recently, YouTubers or young ordinary Singaporeans who use the internet to share sentiments have also been... Um, not targeted, but have also been in the spotlight for sharing some contentious remarks. For example, here a YouTuber Amos Yee made a um, semi-pornographic cartoon drawing of one of the prolific ministers in Singapore and also made an exclamation that many people felt incited religious dissent. And he was charged over a video. He was also sentenced to um, prison and arrested despite his young age. And of course, this hit international news from networks like The Guardian, BBC, The New Yorker. Now briefly, this is several decades of work in one slide. Many scholars have characterized, characterized the uniqueness of Singapore media. It is state-controlled, it's partly free, it weighs pretty low on the Press Freedom Index. It is what many researchers call soft authoritarian, meaning it's still pretty much ruled by a so-called democratic party in terms of its system, but a lot of the lubrications and negotiations of several aspects of society are still pretty much controlled top-down. Um, in the bottom half, you see that the internet is also under constant state policing and censorship. There is the Sedition Act, where people who are found or suspected to have incited any type of dissent, racial against the country, against different minority groups, can be arrested. But because of this, there are several alternative journalism sites and political opposition sites are also on the rise. And it's in this context that I want to situate trolling in Singapore. Now to understand trolling in Singapore as a feedback loop, I want to paint you very quickly what the media ecology looks like. Broadly, there is the mainstream press, mostly um, controlled by the state government. There's also alternative press, not state-sanctioned, but mostly existing on the internet. They are for-profit aggregate sites. So I think you can think of these as the Singaporean versions of something like BuzzFeed.com or CollegeHumor.com, where there are several different types of articles, sometimes newsworthy, sometimes suggest up, sometimes just pop culture oriented. And people come to read articles um, authored by several types of authors, either penned by contributors um, commissioned or by a stable host of writers. And then there are troll pages that I want to focus on today and these are largely fueled by other types of vernacular spaces on the internet. For example, forums in which people on the internet may like to conduct CSI, uh, criminal scientific investigation, criminal scene investigation, a vernacular term in Singapore for saying you really research something thoroughly to get to the bottom of it. SMRT Feedback Limited is just one of several troll groups in Singapore, but it's personally one of my favourites, and I'm going to be briefly going through 9 or 10 points on how this group has operated so far. Originally, SMRT Feedback Limited debuted in 2011. Um, in December, there were two major train public train service breakdowns in Singapore, and even though the country is small, people are highly reliant on public transport, However, this incident with the breakdowns of the train was quite badly handled by the Ministry of Transport. They were encouraging people to say, take a taxi or a cab, which of course is not a luxury that every single person can afford since they can be quite pricey. 
Um, and somewhere down the road in 2014, someone made a list of all these breakdowns. But to begin with, SMRT feedback started in 2011 in response to MRT, the official mass rapid transit in Singapore, having broken down. So it parodied itself after SMRT using its actual logo, um, but called itself SMRT Limited Com Bracket Feedback which is pretty close um, to the original SMRT Corporation Limited bracket SMRT. Um, it started making really interesting troll comments and remarks towards people who were complaining about the transport system, which caused the original SMRT um, page, write SMRT, to issue a disclaimer. Over here it says, hey everyone, do not um, do note that information provided by the other Facebook page might be inaccurate as it's not authorized by us. Do take caution when reading other Facebook page contents. Um, and obviously not everyone got the hang of this type of satire or parody. Um, it even made news, stomp.com.sg, a citizen-oriented and citizen-contributed news website, had several people writing in to say, hey look, this page is actually a hoax. But that didn't end there. SMRT Feedback also pioneered several other types of social media and here they are responding to the current Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Hsien Loong, um, just in response to his official tweet. They say, hey bro, wanna go for a drink? It's a boys' night out. We won't tell Ho Ching, which is his wife. They started trolling other politicians, Teo Chi Hien, then Minister for Defence. Um, he made an apparently ungrammatical tweet that SMRT Feedback found sexually innuendous and they said, we find this seriously disturbing. They also try to engage with official um, ministries or arms, such as the Singapore Police Force. Um, here we, they say we have a stack of Marlboro Reds for your Malay officers. And of course, this was a contentious issue in Singapore back then because every single stick of cigarette in Singapore is labelled and officially approved for use because tax has been paid. More things. We have commuters complaining about the train breakdowns and SMRT writing back to them saying they're not actually the ones who run this system, it's a separate company. People who write in probably incomprehensible ranty debates and SMRT writing equally incomprehensible responses back. Um, people who realize that this is a parody account and write in to ask for their complaints and their rents to be removed. SMRT replying asking them to fulfill five ridiculous questions before this will be done. And also of course high-profile mainstream celebrities who were not aware of the parody account or the troll account and engaged in war of words with them. SMRT Feedback Limited, as they've changed their name from Limited Feedback, later on moved to things related to social justice, and this is where the trolling really became vigilante activism. In this incident, um, a mobile phone shop owner, Jova Chu, um, sold a phone to this man in the picture, a Vietnamese tourist. He paid money for an iPhone 6, but the shop owner was unwilling to let him leave with the phone unless he paid extra money, over a thousand Singaporean dollars more, to pay for an apparent warranty. So the Vietnamese tourist um, in the end wanted to cancel his order. He asked for a refund, but the owner was uncooperative. He ended up kneeling in tears asking for his pay. In the backstory, we later learned that he's actually a factory worker who only earns about $200 a month. So for the owner to film him and then make this video live on YouTube, begging for his money to be um, recompensated, was really quite immoral on, in this sense. And of course, SMRT limited feedback to the rescue. They CSI'd or they tracked down the owner exposed his digital media feeds and started spamming him in all sorts of ways. One of which that really gained a lot of viral headlight um, was the sending of multiple boxes of pizza over and over to his house. And of course, they also found several rather compromising pictures of him with his partner and put them all over the internet. And guess what? Even though what this shop owner did was not illegal, it was really immoral in several senses, after SMRT feedback stepped in and after several other kind strangers came in to raise funds to repay the Vietnamese tourists, the state actually did take action um, against this business. So, um, 
Other web pages then started to feature SMRT limited feedback and how they have become from a troll group to internet vigilantes. And there are very few of these interviews lying around, but basically they are usually asked what do they feel from moving from a satire troll group to being a vigilante group. Um, and they did this not just for the Jova Chu case, but also for several other instances, if you're interested in checking them out. Um, they, also ask, they were also asked, do you think this constitutes cyberbullying? And the reply from SMRT, perhaps. Is it against the law? Maybe. But at the end of the day, we pro provide a platform to publish publicly available information. So they don't feel they are committing what is known as doxing in the terms of Gabriella Coleman and Whitney Phillips who have written about trolling. And doxing really just stands for the bulk upload or publicizing of personal information of people. Later on, there was a second controversy. To summarize my two years of field work, there is an influencer on the left here made contentious remarks against a rival company and SMRT feedback came to the rescue, quote unquote, and started to investigate her in her own terms. The influencer in turn filed a court order against SMRT Feedback Limited that was highly publicized and people were getting worried. SMRT Feedback then responded to say they will be revealing themselves because up till then, and this was in 2014, they were still completely anonymous and no one knew who was running the site. They were baiting readers, updating all their links and all their sites every couple of hours saying that, oh, you know, um, we're really sorry to have done this and this. We're going to be revealing our sites so that no one's going to be able to sue us with a protection order. And of course, all these pseudo officious remarks are always accompanied by humorous images like that. And it turns out their apology was not actually an apology and they were simply trolling the influencer. Here you see her as at Xiaxue. They also um, put up a copy of the apparent protection order served by the influencer to them and said that they did not have to review the identities or apologize based on that court order. So they basically trolled a whole group of people, including the media, I should add, that followed this case very closely and reported on it several times in the whole week. Later on, they also started to ask for donations and if this is any indication of their popularity with ordinary viewers or followers on the internet, people actually donated money to them. 395 people within the first few hours raised 2,800 over dollars. For no cost at all, it just says it's for Tay Tarik supply and Tay Tarik is Malay Singaporean English vernacular for a type of milk tea. So what's next? In the third and my last section on SMRT feedback, trolling the media continues. The people behind the page made up a parody or a satire article saying the man behind the page is believed to be linked to WikiLeaks. And of course, in that context, in November 2014, when this came out, Singapore was one of the several countries who were mentioned during um, the exposure of WikiLeaks documents. However, mainstream news media did not really seem to catch on on this. And somehow along the way, with the broken telephone message being passed down, that image changed into this one. This is a former interviewee on an unrelated article altogether for mainstream press, and someone or something in the system meshed up this entire article with his image, so he ended up suing the official mainstream outlets to remove his image and to dissociate himself. Of course, then the mainstream media um, responded. They said, we've been alerted to a fake page um, and we are glad that the Joker chose our page to spoof out of everything else. We think they do a really good job. But they also end off, if you want real news updates, check out our link. And of course, almost every other newspaper then jump on the bandwagon trying to get clicks by talking about the story. So that was a bit embarrassing. Um, there was also a little bit of ambiguous backlash because for a couple of days, the SMRT limited feedback page was taken down. And in response, two other pages came up, each claiming to be the continuation of the original. And of course, there was some buzz on the internet, especially with vernacular spaces and forums, that they were caught by the quote-unquote internet police or that they were in a crackdown by the government. 
but soon later um, they emerge with a the almost the same category but with a slightly tweaked name and we'll get to that in a bit. In August 2015, a man came out to identify himself as one of the co-founders of the page. In his very long Facebook note, he talked about the idea behind the page, how it started, how he was involved, how he has since left from managing the page and where he thinks the page is going. And in this, really, he was highlighting two things. One, that this was um, the brainchild of several people who met on an internet relay chat. They actually are anonymous because they don't really know each other, although he didn't give detail to how they function. And secondly, it was also slightly social justice oriented in that they felt the state was not managing some things as well as they ought to. He ended up being covered again by other conglomerate websites. Uh, sorry, aggregate websites such as Mothership.sg, the local versions of something like BuzzFeed. But in the same article, um, and in various other articles such as the ones for Tech Asia, he started to brand his website and give us information about his analytics, the reach that his page has gotten, how the community has grown, how he rejoined them in June 15 as a growth hacker, but more interestingly, he seemed to be selling his services. How he's happy to answer any of these questions. Over a hundred questions were put up in a very short span of time. And how he was highlighting his savvy, his digital media savvy, in creating viral content if you ever want his services. So interestingly, what started out as a troll website just for laughs that moved towards um, trolling politicians, trolling people who complain about transport, and then turning towards digital activism, vigilante online activism, suddenly became a very commercial entity in line with the young women influencers that I started out talking about in this presentation. There was a little speculation because of this man's post that the vigilante activist group wanted to contest in the 2015 general elections. And they launched a, a Facebook page called the Tay Tarek Party, basically the Milk Tea Party. Um, of course, with a name like that, it's hard to take them seriously. And they were also drawing a lot of political puns in Singapore. When they say we will not strike, they're referring to the lightning emblem of the PAP, which is the incumbent political party. And when they say we will not hammer you, they're referring to the hammer icon of the Workers' Party, the strongest opposition party in Singapore, where they say we will drink with you, the Tay Tarek party sitting down to their tea. Other instances of them trolling, because obviously here a good fraction of the internet genuinely thought that they were going to contest in the elections, but looking at their logo with the Illuminati symbol, looking at how they're parodying politicians who would use children in their political campaigns, we're still not sure where vigilante activism or what the stance or what the commercial intent of a group like SMRT Feedback Limited is like. So I'm very interested to see how they will grow and following from other scholars who have examined trolling in several contexts, I've showed you how one specific troll group in Singapore has evolved taking on several hats and where they are right now. Also at several points how they have used contentious humour as a form of activism. So that's me, I hope you've enjoyed the talk and I'll probably see you on the other side.